Okay, thank you for having me here. So what I will be talking about is based on the paper uh, which is on the archive, and the work was done together with uh, Dr. Dezrukov and Dmitry Levkov. Uh, here's the plan. So first I will you know, give some general uh, ideas about how to construct semi-classicalized matrices. Then what we want to do with application to gravity and black hole, and what we actually could do. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, so first some generalities. So how we... So we mean in the sentence. What we, is that we, the I mean, uh, me and my, and my cause. Not, not us as a collective community. Or oh, no. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, so S matrix. So just very schematically, uh, we can write, uh, well, any, uh, any transition amplitude, yeah, between initial and final state, is given by... Uh, uh, by Feynman path integral, yeah? So it's an integral over, okay. So here I have integration over initial final uh, coordinate. So phi is collective coordinate of the system. Uh, I insert the uh, wave functions of initial, of final and initial states. And there is a, the, the integral of, um, you know, between, these, uh, the, between the initial and final moments over all trajectories which connect the corresponding configuration. Yeah? Here I put the action of the system. Uh, yeah, with boundary conditions, phi initial, phi final. Okay, and here also I integrate from initial to final time. So well, this is uh, like the standard expression, very formal, uh, very ill-defined in general. But there are two regimes where, where this can be computed. So one is uh, when we, we are doing perturbation series. So when we have a, a few particles in the initial and final states, and the interactions are weak, and then we can expand this perturbatively in, in perturbation series. So this is one regime. Uh, well, which is, uh, so this calculation is actually known to break down for gravity in the regime of strong interaction when we expect to start producing black holes. Well, there is another regime which is uh, also says when this uh, expression can uh, be made meaning, meaningful. Uh, it's the semi-classical regime. So what semi-classical regime means? Uh, and the interaction must be still weak in some sense. So weak interactions. Uh, on the other hand, the number of particles uh, can be large, and actually it is better when it is large. It's a large number of particles. Or, or better to put it more precisely, large occupation numbers. Occupation numbers. Uh, in the initial and final states. Um, let me see if I didn't miss anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then, then uh, under these conditions, uh, the integral can be computed using the saddle point approximation. So let me be more specific. What, what do I mean by large occupation numbers? Uh, what particular initial and final states I will be interested in? So these are the states I will be interested in are coherent states. So they are produced by acting with an exponential on... Uh, on, um, on the vacuum, yeah. So here, I, well, I have, uh, yeah, assume that my, well, I, I use the first condition, that the interactions are weak. So in the initial and final states, the uh, system linearizes and uh, is described by collection of free particles. When you say large occupation numbers, you want that to be true for the initial and final states, or what? Better, better for both. I, 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 will, I will say a bit more about that. But okay, let's, for the moment, let's assume that bo both, for both, it, it's true. For both initial and final states, I, I take them to be described by coherent states with large occupation numbers. So a collision of two high energy particles would not be something that... Uh, not immediately. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, but I will comment on that later. Okay, so, so this I will call a coherent state alpha. So it's described, uh, its parameter is um, <laughs> defined by this expansion coefficients alpha n. And uh, large, large number of particles means that the sum of alpha n squared is much bigger than one. Well, where n uh, is some uh, generalized index for, for the, for the um, say, wave packets, for example. Uh, so this, well, this is the total number of particles, 
which must be large. Uh, ideally, I would also would, would like to have uh, like individual occupation numbers to be large, but that's of course impossible. So some modes will be populated, some not. But uh, we assume that all the, only all the, only those modes which are highly populated kind of are actively participating in the process. Um, yeah. So then I can consider uh, S matrix between two coherent states. I can take coherent state in the beginning, coherent state in the end, both with large occupation numbers. Write similar path integral, and in that case, uh, take take this path integral using saddle point technique. Is all this in flat space? Okay. Well, I'm, descri I'm discussing some very general uh, situation now. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, I, I assume having. But what does uh, an what, what's an occupation number? Sorry. Yeah, I assume having asymptotically flat space. Yeah, That's asymptotically not flat, not necessarily flat in the middle. Okay. Yeah, but asymptotically flat. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I have this integral. This can be taken using saddle point, and the outcome is uh, that this is okay. It's proportional, or okay. Let me put equal to some prefactor, which I uh, well, in principle is, is calculable, but I won't be able to calculate it. So I decide this will leave uh, um, like uh, for the, well, for the moment I don't pretend that I know how to calculate it. Uh, but what then? There is a there is a leading semi-classical exponent, which is the action uh, calculated, evaluated at the classical solution. Plus, there there are some uh, boundary terms coming from uh, uh, from uh, the from from the initial final wave functions. Okay, so here I can put the initial, which depends on phi classical and alpha, and the final, which depends on phi uh, classical, so on the solution, and beta. beta star actually. <clears throat> now, what is this phi classical? So phi classical, as I said already, it's solution of the equations of motion, uh, of classical equations of motion, but not necessarily real. Yeah? Even if I start from a, say, real scalar field here, uh, this solution is in general allowed to be complex. Why? Because well, besides being solution of the equations of motion, it must satisfy the boundary conditions, which are set by the initial and final state. And the boundary conditions, they, have, uh, they, they are formulated in terms of the asymptotics of this solution. So the classical solution at t going to minus infinity, uh, it, as I said, I assume that the field linearizes. So this takes the form of uh, phi minus uh, n un, where un are some modes, okay, can be in, in, the, in the case of uh, scattering of wave packets, so these are wave packet uh, uh, wave functions of wave packets. Phi n plus un star t. Okay, so I have this linearization um, uh, in the initial state. Okay, let me put also index i here. Um, and the boundary condition coming from uh, having a particular coherent state in the beginning uh, is that phi n i minus should be equal to alpha n. So basically that. So the, the, the positive frequency component of, uh, yeah, I always, I'm always confused which is positive frequency, which is negative frequency. Okay, let me call this, which is, which is defined by minus, let me call it positive frequency for more confusion. <laughs> so this positive frequency component must be a, uh, just identical to the to the occupation numbers in the coherent state, and nothing is said about negative frequency component. The original sum was over real fields. Here, yes, the original sum was over real fields. Yes. So this is like steepest descent. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so the, the other component, the the other half of boundary conditions come from the final state. So I, I can also make the same decomposition. Well, basically the same decomposition at t going to plus infinity. I get also positive, frequ positive negative frequencies. And um, uh, the condition of having given final state translates into having, uh, you know, having uh, appropriate, appropriately fixed negative frequency component in the final state. So you see, it's, it's a problem where half of, boundary, half of con boundary conditions are given in the beginning and half are given in the end. So it's boundary value problem. And uh, uh, 
Okay, these are these are complex numbers. So alpha and beta are complex complex numbers. Uh, and as I said, say in the beginning, I cannot insist that this part is complex conjugate to this, because otherwise I won't be able to solve the problem. So that means that in general, this this uh, these coefficients are not complex conjugate to, to these ones, and the solution is complex. Um, okay. Mm. What should I say else about that? Um, yeah. This. Okay. So these techniques it has been uh, has been uh, used in, in field theory and also just to check that it works in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, it could be just directly compared to, to uh, a solution of the Schrodinger equation, and it, and it works. Uh, um, yeah. <clears throat> so if you just took a single harmonic oscillator and alpha and beta were just <clears throat> random coherent states, this classical solution would generally be complex. Well, if you consider a kind of S matrix, you have yeah. to put in some, yeah, yeah some, some perturbation. Yeah, yeah, it will be, yeah. What uh, say a toy model which was studied was a, um, a, 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 a an oscillator whose frequency depends on the on another coordinate. So it's a two-dimensional two quantum mechanics with an oscillator in one dimension and um, with uh, some potential bear in another dimension. So basically, the, the properties of this will depend on the, on the position in the other dimension. Yeah, and then the solution is general complex if you fix uh, occupation number in the beginning and at the end. Occupation number. Occupation numbers of the of the of the oscillator. Fix in the sense of coherence. Yeah, can do it in the sense of coherence state. Yeah. Well, in principle, you can do. You can also fix the occupation numbers. It, it will be a bit different, uh, for, you know, a bit different expression, but similar. I mean, the, the way it's obtained is similar. Yeah, I should also. So there, yeah, I have to make a disclaimer that because the solution is complex, it does not really describe any real uh, evolution. So you should not think about uh, about the solution as describing any real process. Uh, uh, it's similar to the instanton. Instanton does not describe any real process. Yeah. Um, the, well, it may be still that initial and final asymptotics of this solution make some sense because it's C. They are somehow related to the initial final state. So they may, I mean, looking at them, you may get some intuition what it describes. But, uh, but that, that's not guaranteed. Are you assuming there's a unique solution with this problem? Oh, that's a good question. I will come to that. I will come to that. <clears throat> I guess if you're going after the usual semi-classical approximation, wouldn't you uh, be looking for a solution where you, well, which corresponded to just the usual real solution? No, the real, real solution will give only some particular matrix elements where I have initial and final states which are related by real uh, evolution. Yeah? Good. Yeah. But if, oh, I, okay. if I want a different final state, I will get a different solution, which is not real. It just so happens that the saddle is complex for this integral over real variables. Is it like ordinary yeah. integral? Yeah. Over yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Well, there are some satellites here. So one satellite, for example, is about the choice of the time contour, where the solution lives. Yeah? So the solution depends on time, where this time lives. So, uh, originally, the integral, the original integral, ran, of course, along, this, along, along, ran over field configurations defined along real time. Yeah, that was uh, that was the original expression. But then this complex solution is not guaranteed to live along real time. Well, sometimes it can, but not necessarily. So it, it can live, uh, you know, somewhere, somewhere along the contour, which makes, which goes into into complex time. Uh, Goes around certain cuts of classical solutions and come back, and there is nothing wrong with with, with that if the, solu if the solution had the structure. So again, my like, second problem is precisely this. <clears throat> so long as you don't run into funny phenomena like Stokes phenomena. Yeah, uh, yeah. So okay, so I'm kind of, okay. So that's probably time to come to this. Question. So now, true, uh, I, I have this this boundary value problem, but the, the um, the space of solution can be huge because this, this, I'm actually running completely a full with all these uh, uh, com complex, uh, complex configurations. Uh, so how to find the relevant ones? So to find the relevant <coughs> ones, there is a procedure, or, which is, uh, well, at the level of conjecture, uh, that we should start from the solutions which we understand well, like, for example, those which are completely classical and describe certain process, okay, certain matrix element, and then I can 
the form, uh, say, final, initial con final conditions or initial conditions or any parameter of those to the form in continuous steps. And uh, with this deformation, I will get certain class of now complex solutions. And I assume that they still make sense. So basically, that's how I will pick up the relevant solutions by doing small deformations. Uh, I think it, yeah, probably it amounts to the, to the assumption that uh, there is no stock phenomenon in doing this procedure. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, can I ask a, we asked Ted's question? So if you would do this for really just an oscillator with no extra fancy stuff, then this procedure would break down, or, or it would work, but things would not be complex, or, or what? No, but what do we want? A single oscillator yeah. with some uh, time-dependent interaction, or what? No. And you need some perturbation on top of it. Or what? Hmm? What if you don't have that? Ah, uh, if I don't have that, and I find and I start from a, well, actually I will get. Um, let me see. That some of these amplitudes will be zero, or a lot of them. Well, these zero. amplitudes actually won't be zero because, uh, well, in the coherent state representation, they won't be zero because the coherent states are not orthogonal. Actually, I will need this formula, so let me put it here. So the uh, the overlap of two of two coherent states is non-zero. It's uh, it's this. Okay, it depends on the, on the normalizations, but with the normalization I'm, I'm using, it's um, sum of over n, dn star alpha n. So in fact, I will find that. So I will find a certain trajectory. Yeah, in the coherent state representation, I will actually find some trajectory which will give me this. So there will be a complex trajectory. Yeah, there will be a complex trajectory, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> it is because these states are not normalized to one. If you normalize them to one, you'd get something which went like beta and minus alpha and squared, right? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, no, I, no, no, uh, okay. I can normalize, again, well, if I normalize beta and alpha to one, so like that they're not normalized. Uh, yeah, if I normalize, then I have here an addition of uh, bn squared minus alpha n squared. Right, right. So the, the square of the inner product is the, square, is the e to the minus, uh, the difference squared. e to the minus alpha n minus beta n squared. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but I prefer I prefer to have to, to keep it hol holomorphic, so I don't I don't yeah I don't want to put that right away. <clears throat> For this analytic continuation, it's more convenient to keep everything holomorphic, and then include this normalization at the end. Um, okay. Okay. So that was the first part. So more questions about that? Yeah. So how about pair production in an electric field? Right. What what the so the phi is the electric field? Yes. And then what's the, what are the, could you say what the boundary is? Yes. Uh, well, uh, um, well, I know, I know the, the, um, the instant on the Stringer representation, yeah? Yeah, but that's, that's, that's with particles, not with yeah. fields, right? Hmm? But uh, you want for, for the fields? Yeah. Um, <coughs> Uh, let me think. Well, if it's I, I think I think it's given by it, yeah. I, I, it's a big issue. I just thought you know, it's a simple problem, and I thought there might be some simple answer. But if there's not, let's uh, let's, let's not hold you up. Right. Yeah, it's it's a it's a different problem, definitely. But I think I can formulate the same boundary conditions. Yeah, and then we can uh, can look at uh, what what will be solutions. So, uh, definitely, they will be related to the Schwinger circle. Yeah, I mean this. Uh, well, but, right, but that Schwinger, the Schwinger circle involves you know, changing the variables, so you, but you. Deal with yes. Particle, yeah, yeah. Particle trajectory. Yeah, yeah. But this yeah, is like a, that's well known. But you're saying yeah, I would expect this is a geometric approximation to some uh, field theoretic uh, okay. solution. Okay, but yeah. Okay, okay, more questions. Okay, then to to the second part. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So maybe I shouldn't erase that. So now we want to apply it to the gravitational system. So that was very general formalism. And uh, actually, as I said, it was applied to various uh, problems in the field theory, uh, like baryon number violating processes and um, uh, uh, scattering with large final multiplicities. Uh, yeah. Actually, another thing which probably is worth commenting here. Uh, yeah, about the validity of semiclassical approximation. So, so as I said. Ideally, we would like to have occupation numbers large in the beginning and the end, and uh, a rough, like, the, like, like um, a rough, um, quant I mean, a quantity which roughly characterizes the semiclassics is uh, basically the value of, of, of this, of this um, uh, semiclassical, of this um, uh, action that we obtain. Yeah, so this action must be big, must be much bigger than one. It, it need not necessarily be. Uh, 
uh, imaginary. Yeah. So, so okay. In many in many cases, so these processes are exponentially suppressed. So this, because this S has imaginary part. But uh, this is not required. So it's not necessary that this process must be exponentially suppressed. Uh, generically, it will. But even if I have a real uh, action uh, which is large, it's still a, a valid semi-classical approximation. Uh, well, actually, we can go a bit. So preserving that, we, we can go somewhat beyond this approximation. So it was, um, um, so for example, uh, in the case of uh, collision of particles. Yeah, so I can I can start from collision of uh, wave packets with large occupation numbers, but then I can consider a limit uh, that n, say, initial number of particles going to zero. For example, keeping the energy fixed and the initial energy fixed. Uh, and then if if this effective action has a well-defined defined, uh, value in this limit, I can actually consider, uh, uh, and actually in many cases it turns, it turns out to have this well-defined limit. So I can take this value as uh, the leading <coughs> classical exponent describing a process from a few particles into many. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, to do that in the gravitational case, but in principle, that's possible to take these limits and see what happens. <clears throat> OK, so now I go to the gravitational case. Uh, yeah, there is this, this expression for the matrix element. So basically, I want to take it as it is at face value and apply it to gravity. Um, the initial final states, OK, yeah, let me specify more the system which I want to consider. <clears throat> So the metric is part of phi? Yes. Um, yeah, so OK, now I'm specifying the system. So ideally, what we would like to do? Uh, we would like to take scalar field coupled to gravity. Uh, so the total action would be an action of scalar plus action for gravity. Gravity, OK, gravity. Uh, now, uh, it's feasible to solve this, uh, you know, this classical equations, I mean, to find these um, configurations. Yeah, in many cases, it must be done, just done numerically. And it's feasible to do it uh, only in spherically reduced situations. Though, you know, it's not, it's a technical requirement. It's not, uh, it's not um, a requirement of principle. It doesn't seem to be a requirement of principle. Uh, yeah. But technically, okay. So we, consider, we would consider a scalar field plus gravity reduced to, to spherical symmetric configurations. This is like a mini superspace approximation. Okay. Look, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making this reduction at the quantum level. So the quantum theory is full and uh, is four-dimensional. I'm just, I'm just considering initial and final states, which are spherically symmetric. So then I, of course, uh, assume that the solution will be also spherically symmetric. It's, it's only at the level of semi-classics that I do this uh, reduction. Um, OK, so this is um, yeah, the system we want to study. <clears throat> Let me see what I have to say here. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so then the process we want to study. So we, we want to take a spherically symmetric uh, wave packet, OK, with some blurring, some wave packet. With some width, with some width, uh, basically coll collapsing uh, or contracting, uh, and we want to, to, to see the transition of, uh, from this state into similar wave packet. Uh, which expands. Uh, now both wave packets will be made. Uh, will be made of soft modes with omega, with frequencies much smaller than uh, Planckian mass, uh, but with total energy much bigger than the Planck mass. So the total energy, number of, number of particles times omega, much bigger than the Planck mass. So this is very far from what you would expect <clears throat> for the classical evolution from this initial state. Yes. And so this is going to be some exponentially suppressed Contribution, basically? Mm, yeah. In most cases, yes. S matrix. <coughs> yeah. OK, I, I will also come to that. Yeah. Are you going to try to look at the dominant configurations at all in the story? or? Yeah, to try to see which will be dominant. To, to, to very, OK. OK, maybe I will comment later. Let, let's keep this. So for the moment, 
yeah, just two semi-classical configurations. In general, I, will ex I expect it to be exponentially suppressed, true. Uh, well, also depends on the regime. So look, um, so first I can st start from the regime where basically this wave packet classically scatters, scatter classically, doesn't produce a black hole. There is this regime, yeah? So I fix the, uh, the shape of the wave packet, put, uh, put a small energy, I mean relatively small, so that the wave packet scatters. Does the wave packet include the metric? Yeah, the metric in the sense, well, here in the spherical reduced case, it's just given by constraints. But um, so asymptotically, the metric. Um, so asymptotically, it's asymptotically doesn't contribute. It's, it's just flat. So yeah. there's no coherence state for gravitons. No, no, right. no. Oh. Yeah, because gravitons would violate spherical symmetry. Right. So here. You wouldn't have the spherical symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but then in the in the evolution and in the intermediate evolution, the gravity is taken uh, fully into account, nonlinearly. Um, yeah, so I start from small energies where the, 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 this happens kind of classically. I, take, I pick up the classical solution, which describes this scattering, and then I start changing the parameters of, of the final state, uh, say if I want to scan over different uh, coherent states at the end, uh, uh, coherent final states, and I also increase the energy so that I go over the threshold when I expect classically to produce a black hole. And uh, I expect that what I, the, the amplitude which I get, I can interpret as basically the scattering through, through a black hole, because classically I expect a black hole, so. But are um, you still only keeping one classical solution when you approach that threshold? I'm keeping one classical solution, which is, which is determined by boundary conditions, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so here, yeah, maybe I should start from disclaimers. Uh, it was already. Already. Only, sorry, yeah. Just understand. There's only a single classical solution because you've assumed these spherically symmetric boundary conditions. In general, you would have some complex solutions to nonlinear equations in motion. You might have many solutions. Which well, that should be a discrete set because the number of boundary conditions match to the number of equations. So I have second order equations of motion and I have, uh, okay, the proper you're number. You're to be complex. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, but I have two complex, uh, two complex boundary conditions. These are complex equations. The number match. The number of boundary conditions match to the, to the, to the solutions. Is there a nonlinear interaction for the scalar field? It's through gravity. Um, yeah, okay, so some, some um, comments. In general, I expect to get only, uh, yeah, if I, if I now invoke the intuition we have about, about black holes, so black hole decay is dominated by Hawking radiation, which is of course not semi-classical because the occupation numbers are small. So in this way, I probably won't, won't get the dominant contribution into the S matrix, but only some exponentially suppressed tails. Still, I can ask certain questions about them. At least this will be some handle. It's like a tail, you know, the complete S matrix. And I can ask various questions. So one question is, uh, uh, for example, in which sense these S matrix elements are thermal? Yeah, in which sense, I, I mean, the, the intermediate state is thermal. Second, how they depend, how the matrix elements depend on uh, the changes in initial and final states. Uh, third, yeah, third, I, I, what is the relevance of singularity? Is, there, I mean, is singularity relevant for this or not? Or I, I can avoid, because why, why can I avoid singularity? Because the solution becomes complex and in principle I can go away from the singular point. Uh, well, and finally, I can even dream about checking the unitarity of this matrix in the following way. Uh, so I can, I can construct, uh, I can construct an object like that. So I, as dagger S A. So from one uh, coherent state, uh, scatter into some intermediate state, then scatter back and uh, sum over uh, all intermediate states. Mm -hmm. So for, for, yeah. But if you're not getting the dominant configuration in the middle, then you might, that you're, uh, not, you're not going to satisfy the unitary. Yeah, look, what, 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 what can happen? Uh, it most probably will happen. That when I formulate the, the uh, semi-classical equation, semi-classical problem for, for this uh, object, I get that it is, yeah, okay, so it will, be some, it will be actually some solution which goes forward in time and then backward in time, something like that. Uh, and most probably, it, will, it won't just have any semi-classical solution. So the, basically the, the solutions satisfying the corresponding boundary conditions and the equations will be singular in some sense. 
But then I can play and try to, to smear, to, to introduce some constraints. Actually, I will talk about one of possible constraints uh, in a minute. Uh, well, not for this problem, but for a different, uh, for a different obstacle. OK, so introduce some constraints so that here in the middle I integrate only over semi classical configuration. And then, and then, yeah, because you know, I mean, after all, the coherent state basis is complete. So G, C, G, C, OK. C, C, OK, with some weight. Uh, I mean, it, it's equal to 1. Uh, yeah, and then I, well, uh, OK, so that, that I will find. It will be exponentially suppressed, true. And then I will start removing this, this, this uh, regulator. And I can see what happened. So one, one case, like the optimal case, is that when I remove the regulator, this actually goes to the to some, well, with exponential accuracy, of course, uh, because I cannot do better. That it goes to this expression, bn am. Uh, that will be the best possible outcome. So the, I see that the limit of what I get here goes to that. And then this is a test of unitarity. Or uh, it can have no limit in this case. Basically, when I remove the regulator, this object doesn't have any limit, or it has their own limit. OK, at that point, uh, I, I should sit down and think what it means. Does it mean that the S matrix doesn't exist, or it means that the breakdown of the method? But I agree that this part of checking unitarity is kind of uh, speculative. Uh, but rather, rather you know, other questions which I mentioned, I will better post. Okay. <clears throat> you don't expect it to be exactly unitary at the level of this analysis. No, exactly. Of course, I can never get because I omitted the prefactor, for example. No, what I can do, I can only check the leading like exponential behavior and uh, try to understand what it means, trying to interpret it. Um, okay. So that was part two. Uh, more questions? Yes. There's a conflict between checking unitarity and the previous approximation you discussed, which was exclusive processes. Yes. Which were exponentially suppressed. Yeah. In unitarity, you have all processes. Yeah. All final states. Yes. Many of which don't agree with your assumption. So how could you possibly? Yeah, I'm thinking here about summing over intermediate coherent states with, with this formula. This is a complete basis, but you could have coherent states, presumably exclusive probabilities that aren't exponentially suppressed, they presumably contribute mostly. Uh, yeah, they, that, well, the, the fact that they contribute, I will see, uh, I must see, in, the, in this solution, in the settle point solution, becoming singular. Because those configurations which are dominant, they are, uh, they are not semi-classical. But it may happen that the leading semi-classical exponent has a well-defined limit in this case. Like it happened with this, uh, in, in the problem of uh, like two-particle scattering, uh, like um, non-perturbative processes induced by two-particle scattering. Then it happens that the leading semi-classical exponent has a well-defined limit when you send the number of particles to zero, even. I mean, though the solution becomes singular. Uh, no, I must say that here, I, I, about this check of unitarity, I don't insist that it will be uh, uh, yeah, like a, uh, that I will get yes or no from it. I rather my, my my take on that is that here I can try to see what happens, what happens, and then try to interpret it. But if everything's exponentially suppressed and b equals a, you should get one. And how are you going to get that? From ah, no. The, well, just the exponential suppression goes to zero in the limit. S goes to zero. So the exponential suppression disappears, for example. For what channel? Okay, well, that's see. where now this again uh, about what happens in the middle. But yeah, I mean, you're saying yeah, some C. Yeah. Using completeness. Yeah. For which? Yeah, I think I think for the channel. Okay, again, my my guess is that for the channel when uh, C's become small, so in in every particular mode, I get less and less particles. So I, I will see the saturation of my whatever uh, whatever expression in the limit where all the equation numbers become smaller and smaller. Okay, we can discuss it. That's that's an interesting question. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so now what we were able to do so far. Um, <clears throat> Uh, 
Um, OK, we wanted to simplify the problem as much as possible, to, to have some analytic handle on it. Uh, because of course, I mean, well, though we reduced everything to solution of uh, partial differential equations, but it's nonlinear system, so it can be done only numerically. And before doing any numerics, it's better to understand what we are doing, yeah, I mean, <laughs> to what, what we expect to, to, to have as an answer. So uh, the, simp the ultimate simplification which you considered is when both initial and final wave packets are narrow in some sense. Okay. Narrow wave packets, yeah? Then uh, let, the, let us model them by thin shells. <coughs> And thin shells, uh, okay, for thin shells, we, we already can, can do some analytic calculations. So basically, uh, the model we considered was, uh, um, so the action, yeah, is given by, uh, by a thin shell with mass m, some mass m, plus Einstein-Hilbert action, plus Gibbons Hawking term. Yeah, actually, I must also say here that for gravity, I just use Einstein-Hilbert action because, uh, again, of this idea that uh, in this regime where kind of wave packets are spread, when the frequencies are much more than Planckian, this intermediate solution should be also smooth and should be described just by uh, standard GR. Uh, okay, so here I take GR. Um, yeah, okay, so take this thin shells. Now, Thin shells, uh, okay, they are easy to solve, but they, but they don't have this property, which I mentioned, that I want to continue from real scattering to, to say, uh, some classically forbidden scattering. Because thin shells, they always collapse and form a black hole. That's their, you know, that's what they do. Uh, so here we need to, to make a trick and basically assume that, the, well, formally it's just, formally the trick is just to substitute this mass M here by some m effective, which is uh, m square plus l square over r square, where r is the, is the radius of the shell. Now, where this expression comes from? So th th this, this comes from the, from the idea to introduce a centrifugal barrier for, for the shells. So these thin shells can be thought as a collection of dust particles, yeah, I mean, the same. Uh, so what I can do, I can uh, generalize a bit the action by assuming that these particles which are uniformly distributed on the shell, they also have velocities in all directions randomly. So that the classical dynamics of the system is always spherical, but, but they do have some uh, non-zero non angular momentum. So basically this L is the total angular momentum of, of all the particles. Um, okay, you can view it uh, in both ways, either, like, either as this physical, uh, physical uh, model or just a mathematical regularization which allows to have a, you know, configurations which scatter. The action you've written down is the action for one particle, right? but there's another dimension to the shell. Right? So you think that the... Uh, no, this is already the action for the whole shell. So M is... Uh, I already integrated over the sphere here. You integrated out the spherical direction. Yeah, I integrated out the spherical direction here. Uh, okay. <clears throat> well, you're treating it as effectively one... Well, it's like one particle. Yeah, because I'm in reduced uh, situation of uh, one plus one. If the particles have transverse velocities like that, doesn't isn't that inconsistent with the shell remaining a shell? Uh, no, because they have velocities along the along the shell direction. Right. So and in, and uh, isotropically distributed where velocity. Where does the L come from? Hmm? Where does the L? They're not spinning around. Yeah. So every particle is uh, spinning around the center. But then I have many, many particles which are smeared around the shell and uh, also have velocities in no possible direction. I see that you so can set up an initial condition like that, but as the shell is coming in, why would yeah, Oh, this is preserved by devolution. Okay, that's, uh, that's known. That's preserved by devolution. The total angular momentum is zero, but the, the total angular, angular momentum is zero, yeah. Square is, is yeah, zero. so let's put it this way. Li vector is zero, but the sum of absolute values of Li is L. <clears throat> These particles all see the same radial potential. Yeah. Because they all have the same value of L. Yeah. So they move together. Um, yeah, so then what we get? Uh, we get, um, 
yeah, what kind of dynamics we get. So basically, the, well, after I write down the equations of motion for this system, and um, uh, there is only a, a single dynamical degree of freedom, which is the radius <laughs> of the shell, depending on time. So there's a single variable. And for this variable, basically this variable evolves in, a, in, a, in an effective uh, potential. It's like a, a motion of a particle with zero mass in an effective potential. And the effective potential, um, it depends, okay, let me put here, it depends uh, on the total energy of the shell uh, of the system, which is the mass, uh, like I call it M, um, and L, okay, okay, and L, so it depends on both variables. There is, of course, an analytic expression for it, but it's not instructive. What is, what is uh, better is uh, uh, the plot, and the plot goes like that. So for L uh, bigger than certain critical value, which depends on the mass, uh, uh, goes like that. Uh, okay, I have a potential bear. So basically, the shell comes and reflects back. Uh, then what I do, I lower uh, L by, you know, continuously. And uh, this potential goes, uh, of course, you know, goes down. And at some point, classically, I have just transmission through. But I want to insist on considering the process when I have a, a shell in the beginning and the shell at the end. I, I don't want to, the shell to fall into the singularity. So in this language, it's just a, a, an overbear reflection. An overbear reflection. Uh, from, from this, um, it's, yeah, like in quantum mechanics. I have to take basically the same trajectories which I would take in quantum mechanics if I want to consider the overbear reflection. Um, um, yeah, now for overbear reflections. Um, Basically, how, how I find these trajectories. So the trajectories are, let me draw here, the complex R plane. Yeah, the trajectories for over bare reflection, they are found, okay, from this equation which I have here. So they will, hmm, question? They will be uh, given by, implicitly by that, yeah, minus dr or 2 dr, r, something like that, right? Minus sign. Uh, the question is, what is this contour of integral, uh, this integration contour? And the integration contour for, first for reflected trajectories, for classical reflected trajectories. Okay, it runs to the nearby uh, turning point and co comes back. So let me call this reflected this uh, turning point A, and this is and there is another turning point A prime on the real axis. So when I when I decrease uh, L. The two turning points move together, move uh, towards each other, each other, collide, and then go to the complex plane. So one goes here, another comes here. Now, for overbear reflection, I have to pick up the, the uh, turning point which goes down. Uh, OK, well, well, we know this prescription from standard quantum mechanics, but actually, we can also derive this prescription, which, um, yeah, I probably don't have time to talk about that. But there is another regulator which can be included in the whole game to go. So, so, so this is the example of the of the pro, of the situation when I really don't know uh, how to go from from real trajectories to complex trajectories because because of this um, uh, bifurcation of, of the of the turning points. But I can resolve this bifurcation by uh, introducing uh, well another regulator. But yeah, maybe I, I won't speak about that. Uh, well, anyway, we can we can make we can deform the system in such a way that basically these turning points they continuously go uh, into one another. Uh, yeah, it's interesting what happens with this turning point afterwards. So first, okay, first it, the whole the whole uh, calculation looks very much like overbear reflection. So basically, there is some turning point in the complex plane. We have a have this potential here, uh, well, which is below our energy, but we, we have some reflection from it. But when L when the, um, uh, the angular momentum goes to, to zero, the bear, potential bear completely disappears, and the turning point travels, you know, somewhere in the complex plane and comes to r equals zero. Well, so it comes to the vicinity of the singularity. 
uh, and uh, basically the distance from the singularity is controlled by L. Uh, now, how in this case my my contour uh, looks now? Yeah. So now the contour looks like that: that the shell travels and on the real axis. Here there is horizon somewhere, so it must go below the horizon, travels almost to the singularity, make a small ex excursion in the complex plane and comes back. I mean, make this excursion, goes around the turning point and comes back. Uh, so physically the process looks like that: that I have a shell which collapses. Well, basically, the initial part of the, of, the, of the whole evolution is that the shell just goes under under the horizon. Good. That's what I expect. And then, at some point, it comes out from, from like a white hole, probably. Uh, okay, so let me, let me draw it better. So the Penrose diagram uh, looks like that. If I, if I try to embed the shell in the Penrose diagram of the outer metric, um, so there is a shell which goes here. Here it makes a small excursion into complex plane and comes to the real, uh, to the real coordinates and actually propagates backward in time. But then to close the contour of, integ of uh, the time contour, I have to go back because this part of the contour is not on the real, uh, on the real time axis. Uh, if you remember, I, I draw this picture of the general time contour, which would, be, would have this form. It goes like that, comes back, and must come back. So basically, this part of the, of the evolution is somewhere here, roughly speaking. So I have to, to bring uh, the shell back to the real time, and that is done by analytical continuum from here to here. So and then I have here the shell which propagates outwards. OK, so I described this process from colliding shell into expanding shell. Uh, with this kind of embedding. So, sorry, what does it mean to analytically continue along that, that, that form? Say it again, please. I didn't understand what you meant when you said you analyze, You have a solution which is doing something in the yes in this complexified plane. And yes. You analytically continue. Yeah, this is analytical. Like yes. Line. What does that mean? Uh, well, here the solution, the coordinate of the shell is complex, so I don't know what it means. I mean, complex, some complex. Uh, do you have some explicit prescription, or yes. what exactly do you do? Yeah, completely explicit prescription in the sense that I have a solution x of t, um, or t of x, okay, either way, r of t, I mean, um, which I have to consider from initial time to final time, which are both on the real axis. And this, this r can be complex, and t can be complex. So then uh, I know the contour in, in uh, time, which I shall go around to, to get, uh, actually I get this contour automatically. No, it's not that, uh, that I impose it by hand. But from this, uh, from this procedure, I get, I, get, I get the corresponding contour and the, and the, and the solution. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, the problem is that here, well, yeah, to be honest, here R is comp it has, a, it has an imaginary part. So it has a real part, which is basically at large times, uh, okay, let me put here. So R is approximately T. Yeah, okay. The shell just uh, expands with the unit velocity, but there is some imaginary part here. Uh, so this imaginary part is generated when I go from here to here. Would but but the solution stays, stays of this form everywhere. But your boundary condition should be that R is real at TF, right? No. Well, no. That's the way you've drawn it. But that's along this part of the contour. So. Okay, so let me point like that. Right. You've drawn it in the complex R plane. Now here, R is almost real, but this is along this part of the contour. So I end up, so this, this, this asymptotics corresponds to real R, but complex time. You see, I can trade complex time and complex R between each other. One of the things, maybe the confusion is that the two different sides of the black hole have different values of the complex time coordinate. I'm, yeah, here I'm working everywhere just in Schwarzschild coordinates because I'm doing this analytic continuations. Hmm? Different value. I mean, if, you, if the Schwarzschild chord is real on one side, it has an imaginary time. The time variable has an imaginary part on the other. Right? So if you go yes. back to the original well, sheet, 
Totally right. So if you move back to the original side, then if you move according to the equations of, I mean, are you evolving back to the original side according to the yeah. equations of motion? So, yeah. This is four pi i m. Yeah. So this is the, yeah, exactly because when I do the analytic continuations from from this part to here, I get an imaginary part in time. That along this contour, actually, if I compute time using this formula, along this contour, I get imaginary contribution into time. So if I want to bring the, the whole system back to the real time, that's basically this part. This is the board is like the real sheet, and he's coming up out of the board and going back. You know, well, but I guess complex. you could, But I guess when you when you move from one side to the other, it seems like you've been going one way according to the equations of motion, and then are you going back according to the equations of motion or not? Yeah, but here equations of motion are, are just trivial. Uh, the solution is free. So this, this is the free part. When you move in imaginary time, the value of r doesn't change? No, because uh, here I, I have this expression. So free meaning that r is proportional to time. So if, I, if there is any imaginary part of time generated. OK, so here r is real, yeah, at this point. So at this point, it will have uh, this two pi, uh, 4 pi i m. Yeah, so what's the part look like going down the yeah, stack? Right. That's the I think that's what's being asked. Right. What's this what does part? the solution look like that goes down yeah. from the down the step? No, no, that's the part going down. No, the this part. is analytic analytic solution, analytic expression for R in terms of time. It's ever valid everywhere here. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, what I shall say. Uh, Okay, now what, what 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 is the matrix element? The matrix element, uh, well, I, I just take this section and compute it. I, well, I take this uh, trajectory, I take the expression for the action and compute the matrix element, um, and and what I find. So uh, okay, first about the imaginary part, which is probably interesting to look at. Uh, it's non-zero, uh, and it, it's equal exactly to uh, two pi m squared, which is uh, uh, the entropy of the black hole over two. Uh, this this contribution comes purely from the from the horizon, so that's that's interesting. Uh, that the contribution comes purely from the horizon because here when I go around, though r, r though r is uh, uh, real. In the action, there is a, a pole contribution. There is a pole in the expression for the action. So when I when I go past the horizon and backward, I get you know some contribution into this action. Uh, while this part, this part which uh, comes from kind of this of the singularity, I also have a well, for, for non-zero l, I have a small contribution from here, but it vanishes when l is sent to zero. Uh, so in this sense, a singularity seems to be irrelevant to to this expression. <clears throat> um, yeah, then physical interpretation. So this is this is very well, maybe uh, something natural to expect that basically I have a, uh, so the picture is like that, that I have a wave packet which collides, which collapses and forms a black hole and then this black hole decays in a featureless wave packet. And of course this uh, decay is suppressed by the entropy of black holes because it decays at a single state. So if you did the, the sort of Parnik Wilczek approach to black hole evaporation by tunneling? Yes, and very. It, then you would, that's, that's just the same as this. That, that's just basically the same as the second half of this calculation. Yes, that's the same answer. Uh, there are there are some things which I didn't understand in the uh, um, radiation as tunneling picture, where basically I never under, could understand where the shell they consider comes from, because they consider like a you know quantum mechanical uh, situation when you have a particle which goes to the potential barrier, okay, and then they find the transmission coefficient. But where this particle comes from? So here, th this this particle or the shell, it actually is there from the beginning. It's the shell which we consider. Uh, another another uh, feature here is that the expression for the action is uh, the original expression is is a completely coordinate invariant. So in in, in the in the Schwarzschild coordinates. Uh, say the contribution the, into imaginary part of the action comes both from co crossing the horizon inside and outside. Looks a bit weird. I mean, why, why shall I get any contribution from crossing inside? Uh, but the answer is that uh, separately these two contributions doesn't make sense. You have to consider the whole uh, the whole integral. And if I go say to Pandelier coordinates, I don't get any contributions from coming in, but I get it twice more from coming out. So is the over two because the process is the amplitude squared? Yes. Yeah. Over two is just because of that. 
<clears throat> uh, another thing which, in, which we can get compared to the, in addition to what uh, uh, this uh, Hawking radiation is done in the picture, is that we get the real part of the, of the, of the action, which describes the phase shift. And uh, say for a massless shell in the limit when L goes to zero, it also has a well-defined limit. And uh, it's given by this. It's given by, OK, so here there is some problem because uh, we, we considered um, four dimensions. And there are uh, some logarithmic divergences associated to long-range interactions in the initial final state. So we had to regulate them. So because of that, we had to introduce some, some you know, coordinate which normalize the phase, where basically the phase of the wave function vanishes. And there is a logarithmic contribution uh, proportional to that. <clears throat> uh, but then there is the final part, m square. So basically, the phase shift is given by the same, well, it's of the same order as the imaginary part. OK, but we know the coefficient. So coefficient is just one. <clears throat> um, yeah, and also, th this, uh, this phase shift depends so what our, our, zero, our zero here is just the distance from the center where I start my wave packet, kind of. So it's um, so th this first part is just the geometrical geometrical contribution coming from the wave packet propagating towards the center and then backward. Uh, if if there were no logarithm here, I could just send this R zero to, to zero to normalize uh, my wave packets appropriately. But I cannot do it because of this log. Uh, but but this is the, the well this is the meaningful uh, phase shift. Um, yeah, what else? <clears throat> ah, yeah. This log looks like it has to do with the amount of time to, the amount of Schwarzschild time that it takes to fall yeah. to the horizon. Yeah, mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I, well, in higher dimension must be absent, so maybe it's worth uh, repeating quickly. Yeah, well, in higher dimension. It's a different factor. Hmm? I think it's just a different uh, term. It's not absent. You think there will be some contribution? Well, into, mm. Because here, in our case, it really came from some log divergence of the of the um, of the total action associated clearly with Newtonian interaction at the final level. Maybe it's subleading. Yeah. Uh, can you read off the time delay uh, from the phase? So the the time. Uh, yeah, the time delay is m here. It's I would m. say. Yeah. Um, why doesn't the log term? Okay, plus log. But log is something which is related to the like um, shift of the phase because of Newtonian interaction in the outskirts. So this log is, is like the logarithmic log. uh, Shapiro time delay at long distances. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, so for Schwarzschild black hole. Uh, after all, getting here m square. Okay, so it's nice we get this result. Uh, this, yeah. Okay, but let's look here. So um, could be a coincidence because uh, m square you just get by dimension on dimensional basis. There is nothing else, and the coefficient okay could be two pi, two pi just comes uh, uh, accidentally because uh, everything is, is made out of uh, uh, residues. So, okay, no wonder you can get two pi. So basically, uh, it's bad. It's, it's I mean we, we want to check it at something which has more parameters in the game. Okay, and we checked this. So we checked it for ADS for the case of black hole in ADS. And uh, again, get the same result, well, this result, that uh, the imaginary part is just equal to uh, entropy over two, which comes, well, which comes out rather non-trivial there, because the expression for the action is, is something uh, quite complicated. The pole contributions are also quite complicated, but then there, is, there are cancellations, and, and everything combines into, into the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, and also, we did it for uh, charged black holes. Uh, where the situation is, is more tricky. Okay, do I have like, uh, how much time do I have? What do you need at this point? Well, maybe 10 minutes. Okay, five, I can, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Speak quickly. Yeah, I, I just have time, I need time to draw something. So uh, for, for black hole, for charged black hole, if I just take a charged shell and nothing else, uh, I get rice and the metric, and then say the solution which I get, which I get in that case. Yeah, so here I'm drawing rice and Rothschild. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
The solution I get in that case is that the shell goes in, uh, goes through outer horizon and through inner horizon, reflects because it's charged, reflects from the charge singularity, repels basically from it, and comes back, it comes back, yeah, comes into the other asymptotic region. Um, okay, so that's the solution I get, and the expression for the imaginary part of the action, twice, is for, for this solution, is R plus, where it's positive horizon, minus R minus squared. So it's like the difference of the two areas. So the incoming, the outgoing state is in a completely different. Um, that's that's probably not a problem, problem because no, because from here I have to make analytic continuation backward. You have to go back. Yeah, so maybe I, uh, maybe that's okay. So I don't understand. There's a is this solution complex as well? I mean, yes. Is it? I understand it's complex since we're that time is complex. But yeah. there is a completely real solution in Kruskal coordinates. To yes. Exactly this. Yes. Is this the same solution written in? Complex virtual yeah, coordinates? But, yeah, but, yeah, but when you map it into Schwarzschild coordinates from Kruskal, uh, you get imaginary contribution coming from the time. Because actually this expression for uh, effective action, it contains also you know, contribution associated with, um, like with uh, boundary, uh, these boundary terms. And the boundary terms, they contain in particular, like in quantum mechanics, they would contain this term. Uh, energy times, uh, times time, times time, difference of times, initial and final times. And uh, uh, when I do this analytic continuation from here to here, I get imaginary, imaginary part here and here. In, in this, this is where I'm worried by this phrase to do an analytic continuation. I mean, there is there's a solution which is just this in real Kruskal coordinates. And in that form, its action is manifestly real. Yeah. And so I'm confused. One thing you could be doing is just rewriting that in complex Schwarzschild coordinates. Yes. Which couldn't change the action because the action is invariant even under complex coordinate transformations. Yeah, but I have to define carefully the the um, the action. So the, it's not just this, it's not just just the action from here to here, but it's action plus some boundary terms, and the boundary terms can also become complex. Why? Uh, but, but okay, maybe I, I, I maybe I, I should not concentrate on that because I actually I'm going to argue that this solution is unphysical. Okay. First of all, <laughs> yeah. So it's unphysical uh, because um, because um, well, it's unphysical in field theory. Okay, maybe for a single charge shell, that's probably the answer. But okay, we don't believe in the existence of single charge shells and their meaning, meaning, meaningfulness. So for a field theory, we know that this inner horizon will actually be destroyed by uh, mass inflation singularity, or better to say, by discharge of of the singularity. So basically, the singularity will will discharge and become, so this whole, this whole uh, Penrose diagram will go just to a, sim to a simple uh, Schwarzschild, uh, Schwarzschild diagram. Co in, in like, um, the causal structure will be the same of the, as, uh, of the Schwarzschild black hole. I don't think that's quite accurate for mass inflation, but it's probably close enough for your purposes. Okay, maybe. Okay, we should discuss that. But okay, so assuming that it goes here, uh, I can actually can model. I can model discharge of the sh of the singularity in in my reduced spherically symmetric uh, model, and the discharge will be modeled just by putting the charge of the shell to depend on the radius. Yeah, and I, I make it like that. That the charge uh, basically vanishes when 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 um, the, the electromagnetic coupling constant vanishes when uh, R goes to zero. Um, and once I do that, once I do that, uh, I actually recover the, the entropic suppression. So this uh, inner horizon disappears completely, and also, and independently of the choice of this function, again, everything combines in such a way that I recover the entropic suppression. You're saying that you need to take into account discharge of the singularity? Yes. In order to get the usual entropic. Yes. So that's the moral. So the moral of this uh, charged example is that the charge of the singularity is, is uh, needed to recover this thermodynamic kind of thermal type behavior for the matrix element. Yeah. It's a little surprising because uh, I completely agree that this, as a real physical solution, there's an instability there. But I thought there was some evidence that uh, for doing analytic stuff like this, the solution has some relevance. You know, for example, people computed these, these well, this weird numerology about inner and outer horizons and the, the difference in entropies being an integer. 
and also some ways that that, that appeared in the quasi-normal modes and so on. So I wouldn't think it would be crazy to use this path in you know in some animal to compute some saddle point. Also, well, maybe for some purpose it, it can be uh, adequate, but not for this problem. So for the, apparently, so apparently not for, not for this problem, because uh, th this answer actually which which appears this r plus minus r minus which appears in the pure shell model from the point of view of this shell model that's that's how it should be actually because the suppression cannot start with a jump, yeah this sub exponential suppression uh, should change change continuously from zero okay so at the moment when uh, the classical uh, classical reflection becomes uh, impossible so basically when these horizons appear. It should be zero. While if you just take entropic suppression, it, may, it has a jump. But what well, this regulator, what it allows to do is actually allows continuous change of, it, well, it, it, it leads to continuous change of um, the horizon radius from zero, uh, slowly and continuously increasing. Um, and that's, uh, does, so does the interpretation make sense for extremal, for the extremal case? I mean, there I might have guessed that no black hole. For the it also applies, yeah. Formed, so it shouldn't be suppressed or something like that at all. So you are um, you are asking if um, um, are you asking that um, if extremal black hole should not should not decay? Are you are you asking about that? Or if not? a collapsing extremal shell should um, not have exponentially suppressed reflection probability. Yeah, and that's what happens in this, in this uh, re regularized model, kind of, which accounts for discharge, actually. So in the, in the case, if I, if I don't account for the di discharge, the exponential suppression would behave like that. That I have, um, uh, say, energy, I increase energy, and then the suppression is 0, 0, 0, and then, oh, it jumps and um, increases. If I if I take entropic suppression here, so this is the plot for 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 this case. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is extremal extremal black hole, and uh, there is some discontinuity, which cannot appear, which should not appear in this kind of uh, uh, problems because uh, the suppression should change continuously. Uh, okay, so if I take instead this expression, it indeed changes continuously, but I get something different from the standard. From the standard, from what I expect entropically, yes, I don't recover the entropic formula. Uh, on the other hand, if I in introduce this regularization, I get, which is not regularization, it's a model. It's a model for discharge. Yeah, then I get something like that. But maybe it's right that you don't recover the entropic formula because you're, it's not like you're doing a, a process on a background that has a definite horizon size. You know, the, the space time is being created by the shell as it's propagating. Well, look, I so don't. It has, a, it has an initial. Well, I'm not trying to impose that by hand. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to impose this entropic suppression by hand. Uh, I'm trying to see if I get it or not, yeah? Now, uh, for me, it, entropic suppression looks natural because I have this interpretation that basically this is the probability of a black hole to decay into a single uh, state, yeah? Uh, what I see that if I don't include discharge, I get this formula, which is not standard entropic suppression. Okay, you may find interpretation for it. I don't know. Uh, but if I account for the discharge, then I recover the good old entropic suppression. So from this point of view, okay, maybe a mild statement is that discharge of the black hole must be taken into account to recover entropic suppression of this kind of process. Okay. Uh, of course, the next step, okay, what, what we are doing now is to take some field theory where you can, can have a, you know, softening of, um, of the quanta uh, and to see how, I mean, if this is translates into there, to what, to what extent this translates into there. Okay, thank you. In your last comment, what do you mean by softening of the quanta? Uh, meaning that I... Yeah, in that case, I, w I could consider, you know, like I could change uh, basically the, the frequency, characteristic frequency of initial final state, and I would expect that the uh, softer final states will be preferred. Uh, still, okay. still far. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? I just want to make sure when you draw that diagram, that's like a trajectory on a riser Nordstrom background. Yeah. But really, the shell is creating the background as it goes, right? Ah, yeah. Well, I'm patching. So, so here, 
Yeah, so here I take on the uh, out, um, outer part of right. it. Uh, yeah, this, of course I'm patching the two geometries. That's how the whole geometry is the, the patch of the two along the trajectory. And uh, here I have to take on the, the outer part. Well, actually for this diagram I, I'm even confused whether I have to take this singularity or not. Uh -huh. I don't know. Um, yes, for your exact solution, as you say, that's the leading design. Yeah, but I, yeah, I prefer to go to the other one, which, which is structured, and there I understand much better what, what's happening. But, but you know, I mean, if, if your shell is very, very close to spherical, then the region which is removed is actually just the region above this. Uh, so you keep the little. No, no, it's um. Uh, Okay, so in, in the Schwarzschild case, yeah, the shell goes like that. I actually keep, as far as I remember, how did uh, it go? I, I think I think I keep something up to this. I just mean if you're solving the problem of a real collapsing charge shell in crystal coordinates. Ah, for real, for this for this one. Then the correct answer with the instability. Yeah, then I keep that. Then I have to keep that. You don't keep with with the instability. Ah, with you the don't instability. keep that, but you keep the little triangle that's to the right. Which one? Okay, go to the the bifurcation of the surface of the inner horizon is right there. Yeah. You keep the triangle just to the left. This one. No, the one to the left. The left. You keep it a little bit there. This, just I, to this the, I keep the same. That part to the right of your shell. Yes. You keep everything up to that. No, but this is this is already unstable. I don't understand. No, it's not. Wow. It's uh. only the other one that's unstable in this configuration where you have one asymptotic region and an incoming shell. Okay, that we must discuss. According to, to what I understand, that other people understand, this is unstable already. I mean, these both are unstable. No? Okay, that's... that's only the only one, the one with is an infinite blue shell. I think they're both, yeah, in a static black hole, yeah. they'd both be singular, but the mass inflation singularity is only on the other one, as you say. So a singularity caused by infalling stuff yeah. is only on... Yeah, right. One. There's, there's no asymptotic region But the region field is singular. I remember thinking it wasn't, and Bill Hiscock convinced me that it is singular on both pieces of yeah. the inner horizon. That's, that's how I understand it. In context where there's only really a single asymptotic region um, in a collapsing shell? No, no, no. About that. If you have no. the two asymptotic region black hole, they're both singular and unstable. Yeah. But when you have only one asymptotic region, it's just the ingoing inner horizon which is unstable. Yeah, you can kind of see there's no yeah, evolution. Yeah. No, I also maybe we should oh, thank maybe we should thank him again and, and move into the, the, the dirty geo discussion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>